evil fruit of pride. And I've thought about this uh, for a little while, and I've preached on pride before. And, you know, I, I think it's important that, that we analyze and we look at the fruit that is produced from pride. And because, well, let's pray first and I'll get into it. Father, Lord, I, I pray you bless us now. I pray, Lord, that you'd speak to our hearts. Help us to see this, Lord, in our own lives. Help us to war against it. For God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says, The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. You know, the Bible speaks a lot of pride, against pride, and really warns the saints of God against pride. And shows the damage of pride. But one thing that, that I want to talk to you about, and I've talked about the proud heart before and many of things, I want to talk to you about the fruit that pride produces in the life of a person. What if, if pride is allowed to reign in the heart of a person, it produces fruit. And that fruit is damaging. That fruit is dangerous to, to the believer, to the unbeliever, to any man, it is dangerous. But to the believer, it is. And, and we're going to go through and, and look at the fruit of pride and see what it produces in, our li in the lives of believers and lives of people. Now, this first verse, so I'm going to take a series of verses, and I'm just going to go through there and show you the fruit and, and show you what pride does in the life. It says, the wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. The wicked through the pride of his countenance, in consequence of his pride, or his pride is the reason of what is here stated, the pride of his countenance is a phrase that is used because pride shows itself mainly in the countenance. It shows itself in the countenance or the life of that person. You can see it. It takes on many different forms, though. It's not always this nose in the air loftiness it, or haughtiness. It can be in many different ways. It could be in the form of a false humility to where you walk around and act as if you're humble, but really you're not. It's a false humility because the fruit of that pride is showing in that person's life. The pride of his countenance. The design is to state the influence of pride in producing the effect here specified. Pride has an effect on the, on the countenance of a person. It will eat them up and destroy them. And we're going to talk about that too. But the fruit of it is it shows on the countenance of the person. And consequently, consequently what happens is they will not seek after God. Something clearly is, is to be supplied, and it is plainly something relating to God. Either that the wicked man will not seek after God in prayer, or that he will not inquire after the proofs of his existence and attributes, or that he will not seek after his favor, or that he will not endeavor to know the divine will. All this would be implied in seeking after God, and this is undoubtedly the state of mind that is referred to here. The sinner is unwilling and in any appropriate way to acknowledge God. Man, they will do anything they can not to acknowledge the God of heaven. Anything they can. They will find any way they can. Because the pride is which, that which causes unwillingness. Listen, that goes for the saved or the lost. In pride, he will not seek after God. In the circumstance or trial that you are facing in your life, if you are proud, you will not seek after God. You will not seek the real solution that is found in the Word of God. You will not seek the truth because for some reason your circumstance, your solution, your problem, whatever you're going through, is too far above Scripture. And that's pride. It's all that is is pride. God has the answer in his word. And if you don't see it, it's because you're too proud to. You don't want to see it. And that's the real truth of the matter, friend. You don't want to see the answer. Sometimes we think because a man is quiet or reserved, it means he is humble. But that's not necessarily true. Sometimes he is too proud to get the help that he needs. 
Too proud to admit there is a problem. Too proud to seek after godly counsel or advice to get the help he needs. So he silences himself. He's quiet. He has this false humility and this reservation that looks as if that he's a very humble person. That doesn't mean that that person is humble because of that. If a man is humble and has true humility, then he will admit his faults, he will admit his wrong, and he will not point his finger at somebody else. Here is a sure way that you know you're dealing with a proud individual. Is when you come to them and there is a problem or an issue and they point their finger right back at you and say something to you in return. What does that mean? It means that they're proud. It means they are proud and what they're saying to you is, is that, no, I, there's something wrong with you. Because let, let, let me tell you something. Let me explain to you something. There may very well be something wrong with you. But that does that that should never that should if somebody points out a flaw, a character flaw, an issue that I have in my life, a downfall, a sin, something wrong with me. If somebody points that out, the last thing that should be on your mind is what somebody else did wrong. Seriously, I want you to think about that for a second. How in the world could you ever be a better Christian? How could you ever grow in the Lord if you cannot be humble enough when somebody comes and shows you your clear wrong and you say, well, it's so-and-so's fault, it's this person's fault, it's that person's fault, but this person did this and this person did that. No, you're dealing with a proud man. You're dealing with a proud man. That's what you're dealing with. Somebody that is so full of pride that they will not admit that they are wrong. When the clear transgression is there, that's a very that ought to, that's a very scary place to be, but that's the fruit of pride. It's exactly what that is, and it shows. And you can't hide it. You can't hide it under a false humility. You can't hide it in any way. There ain't no way you can hide it. You aren't going to hide it. It is inevitable. People can see it everywhere. It shows. Pride renders God a disagreeable object of contemplation to the wicked and a knowledge of him as, as undesirable. Pride consists in an unduly exalted opinion of oneself. Mm -hmm. it's therefore Im it's there it is therefore impatient of a rival, hates a superior, and cannot endure a master. That's pride. Plain and simple, friend. Plain and simple. I'm going to read it to you again. Therefore, impatient of a rival, hates a superior, and cannot endure a master. Not at all. That is pride. And I'm going to tell you what. You can try to paint it any color you want to. You could try you could try to change it. You could try to give it a facelift. You could try to do whatever you want to, but you ain't fooling nobody. That is pride. That's exactly what it is. Plain and simple. Pride of the wicked prevents them from seeking the knowledge of God by rendering them unwilling to be taught. Pride is almost as impatient of a teacher as of a master. Pride renders the wicked unwilling to use the means by which alone the knowledge of God can be acquired. It renders them unwilling to study the Bible in a proper manner. We've seen it. How many pastors have we talked to about this issue? How many pastors over the years have you talked about 501c3 and all those issues? And they can't possibly learn from you. They couldn't possibly hear anything from you. They couldn't possibly. They were pastors and they knew what was right and they knew what it was. They could not be taught. It renders them unwilling to study the Bible in a proper manner. Pride also renders the man unwilling to pray. Yeah, pride will keep you from prayer. Why? Because prayer is one of the hardest spiritual exercises you'll ever do. It is the most challenging. You'll want to sleep. You'll want to. You'll get distracted. You'll want your mind. I mean, Peter, the, the apostles, they were the same way. Could you not tarry one hour? Jesus said. Could you not tarry one hour? 
I mean, one hour? Couldn't you just give one hour? You couldn't tarry one hour? Watch, therefore. But pride will keep you unwilling to pray. Because the last thing the devil wants you doing is praying to God. I'll tell you that right now. That's the last thing he wants. And it prevents him from improving public and private opportunities for acquiring religious instruction. The pride of the wicked will not allow them to seek after the favor or the likeness of God. It makes them unwilling to seek after communion with God. They're the countenance so-called because though pride be properly seated in the heart, yet it manifests in the countenance. You can't have pride in your heart and it not manifest in the countenance. You cannot. It will come out. When your heart is full of pride, it's coming out. One way or another. The wicked through the pride of his countenance, that is of his heart, appearing in his countenance is a master pocket in his forehead. For pride buddeth. The pride of Israel testifieth to his face. The thoughts are oft seen in the countenance, and the heart is printed upon the face. It is a hard thing, saith one, to have a brazen face and a broken heart. <laughs> Don't tell me you're humble and contrite before God when you walk around in pride and arrogancy and can't ever be wrong. You're lying. Now, you ain't lying to me very well, because I know what that's like. You know when somebody's broken before God. You can't hide that. You can't hide being broken before God. I don't know what kind of game you think you're going to play, but you can't play that game before God. It doesn't work. Friend, it doesn't work. This Bible is true, and it reads you no matter if you read it at all. It still reads you, and it's still true, and you ain't fooling nobody. So doth pride disable the soul from doing duty, and at last breaketh forth into odious deeds, abominable to God and men. It, it, it is observed that the ground wherein the peacock useth to, useth to sit by, that occasion made exceeding barren. So where, so where pride roosteth and reigneth, no good groweth. That peacock just ruins that. That land is done right there. That spot is. Nothing's going to grow there. That's the same thing with pride. When pride gets into your heart and grows and grows and grows and grows, there's no spiritual growth going to happen there. Nothing good can come from that. Through, through the pride by which he scorns to stoop to God or to own any superior, they not only, they not only do not respect God because of the pride, that fruit of pride causes them not to respect anyone else. They cannot respect anyone else. And makes himself and his own lust his own rule. His own lust, his own rule. And his last end, and is full of self-confidence and a conceit of his own self-sufficiency and unchangeable felicity and is hated. We're going to talk about we're going to talk about self-deception in a little while here because that's a fruit of pride as well. Next, turn to Proverbs chapter 11, please. The evil fruit of pride is shame. Proverbs chapter 11, verse number 2. When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. The proud man thinks much more of himself than any other can do. And expecting to be treated according to his own supposed worth, which treatment he seldom meets with, he is repeatedly mortified, ashamed, confounded, and re rendered indignant. Expecting that somebody ought to treat you better than what they do. Ought to treat you how highly you esteem your own self. The advent of pride. Pride is inordinate self-appreciation. 
It is inordinate self-appreciation. It is me looking at myself. You will, Listen to me. When somebody woe is me, woe is me, woe is me, and lives their life like that, you're looking too much at yourself. Right, and that's the height of depression is, self, is, is, is self-worship. I'd get depressed, too, if I kept looking at myself very long. No, not at all. Not at all. Pride is inordinate self-appreciation. This feeling comes to a soul. It is not born in it. Infancy and childhood are free from it. So how does it come? By associating only with inferiors. If you're always associating with people that that have never grown, have never have never prospered, have never lived for the Lord, have never had uh, the victorious Christian life, or their life is so bad and they are so wicked. It's like people that come from wicked parents and wicked people, and you only are around that, then you start to think yourself better than other people. And you start to think that other people ought to treat you better and that you deserve more, and, 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 the, and your eyes get on you. Sit around and think too much about your own feelings. By practically ignoring the true standards of character, when we lose sight of the eternal law of rectitude and judge ourselves only by the imperfect standards around us, pride is likely to come. It's not having an honest, an honest understanding of who we really are. <laughs> it's not a sober-minded evaluation of who we are. That's when pride comes. When it's so simple for you to point out somebody else's sin, but not your own, you're drunk on pride. You're absolutely drunk on it. You are intoxicated with pride. By a practical disregard to the majesty of God, that's how it happens, the conscious pre presence of God humbles us. When you're walking in the fear of the Lord, <laughs> when you're reading God's book, when, you're, when, when you are allowing God's word to speak to you without trying to resist the Holy Ghost by not hardening your heart, when God's word gets in there into your life and your heart, it's hard not to be sober-minded and be like, huh. when somebody says something about you, it's like, yeah, and then some. They don't even know the half of it. I'm sure glad they don't know everything about me. Paul talked about being very careful not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. But to think soberly, he said. What did he mean by that? Stop being so proud. When we lose sight of the eternal law, by a practical disregard, excuse me, I'm going to keep going, the evil of pride, then come a shame. That's what happens. That's the fruit of pride is shame. The man who has formed a false and exaggerated estimate of self must be disappointed one day. When you, th when you build yourself up in your mind to be this big, huge uh, spiritual gift of God to everybody and, 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 and you are this big or you are this great person, everything, and then you have to look in the mirror one day and see who you really are. Shame's coming. It does hurt. But it's a good hurt. One that we all need. That's right. It brings a broken and contrite spirit. That then you'll finally have the fellowship of his sufferings. You'll finally get to know who God is when you've been through that. I'm going to tell you what the problem is. Some of you have never been broken. That's what the problem is. 
I'm not talking about boohooing and crying. I'm not talking about being depressed. I'm not talking about being down in the dumps. There is a difference in that. That is worldly sorrow, and that sorrow worketh death. I'm talking about a godly sorrow that doesn't have you pointing your finger at mommy and daddy, cousin, sister, the butcher, the, the candlestick maker, and everybody else, but it has you looking at your own life, and you say, no, it's me, God. It's me. I am undone. It's a problem you've never been broken. Because when you're broken... Last thing you do is point that finger at somebody else. Man, that is the absolute last thing you could think of. When you are rebuked and you are reproved, and you, the last thing you think about is somebody else. Just, I'm telling you, I, I, I can't even imagine it because when God has dealt with me and I have done something wrong and I have failed God, the last thing I look at is, man, I wonder if I can blame Lee for something. Yeah, I wonder if I can... Point out something in Lee's life that will make it easier on me. You know what that is? Pride. That's a man that's not broken. Because a man that's broken, he can't even look up. and He don't even care what you've done wrong. Huh? Yeah, I don't care what you did wrong. I care what I've done wrong. I care what's wrong with me. It's a shame of folly. Man must always find his level. He must come to realities. The shame of folly, the soul bursts with a sense of its own foolish estimate. You know, the prodigal had to come to that, didn't he? He came to, what does it say? He came to the end of himself, didn't he? He looked up and he remembered his father's house. But he had to get in the pig pen first, didn't he? And I'm afraid some of you haven't been broken yet, and that's why you're like that. I'm not afraid of it. I know it. And what you have to understand is, it don't matter to me if you get mad at me. It just shows your pride even more. So it doesn't bother me. Look at me. I'm not flinching. I'm not looking away. I don't have a problem with it, and I'm preaching straight on. You better understand that it don't bother me one bit because I know exactly that Satan loves your pride and he wants to use your pride. He'll use it to destroy this church. He'll use it to destroy your life. Shame of guilt. Pride is a wrong state of mind and hence shame follows it. The nature of pride with its attendance and consequences. Pride simply considered is an immoderate degree of self-esteem. Or an overvalue set upon a man by himself. And like most other vices, is founded originally on an intellectual falsehood. That's why Paul said, Not to think more highly of yourselves than you ought to. But this definition sets this vice in the fairest light and separates it from all its consequences by considering man without relation to society and independent of all outward circumstances. Pride thus defined is only the seed of that complicated sin against which we are cautioned in the text. In speculation, pride may be considered as ending where it began and exerting no influence beyond the bosom in which it dwells. But in real life, pride will always be attended with kindred passions and produce effects equally injurious to others and destructive to itself. See, when you get proud and arrogant, you don't just take down, you don't just take down yourself. You take down everybody else with you. Because you won't be, your pride won't let you be satisfied with just destroying your life. You've got to destroy everybody else's with it. That's right. He that overvalues himself will undervalue others.
and he that undervalues others will oppress them. It won't be enough. It won't be enough for you to undervalue them. You will oppress them. Pride has been able to harden the heart against compassion. Proud people have no compassion. They don't care. They don't care if you're in a tough spot. They don't care if you're if you're if 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 something's going on wrong. They don't care about that. They can't. Why? Because of their pride. Because they're lifted up with pride. Lifted up with it. And stop the ears against the cries of misery. It makes masters cruel and imperious. And magistrates insolent and partial. It produces contempt and injuries and dissolves the bond of society. Nor is this species of pride more hurtful to the world than destructive to itself. The oppressor unites heaven and earth against him. He that sets too high a value upon his own merits will, of course, think them ill-rewarded with his, with his present condition. When you set a high value on your own merits, on your own works, on everything that you've done, then you'll think an Ill re- you're, you're ill-rewarded for your efforts. He will endeavor to exalt his fortune and his rank above others in proportion as his deserts are superior to theirs. Once fired with these notions, he will attempt to increase his fortune and enlarge his sphere. And how few there are that prosecute such attempts with innocence. A very transient observation will sufficiently inform us. To pride, therefore, must be ascribed most of the fraud, injustice, violence, and extortion by which wealth is frequently acquired. Another another commitment of pride is envy. Envy. Or the desire of debasing others. Envy. That is one thing that I have seen in people's life. Envy. And pride is the reason why people are envious. They will look at somebody else's life and they will be jealous of that person. They will envy that person. They will envy their stature. They will envy the fact that people respect them. That person, they will envy everything about that person or other people. They will envy them. And it's pride. Because you think that you're better than that person. And you are then envious of the fact that people listen to them, people respect them, people care about them, or any of those things. Because it's envy. And it's pride. It is the fruit of pride. And it's so easily seen. It's, it's so absolutely, blatantly obvious that you can't hide it, friend. You can't hide those things. You cannot hide those things. A proud man is uneasy and dissatisfied while any of those applauses are bestowed on another, which is desirous of himself. Which he is desirous of himself. What does that mean? It means if you see somebody else being blessed, you're not happy for him. Why don't I have that? How come I'm not blessed like that? Because of your pride, that's why. God can't trust you with it. You're not trustworthy. So why would he? You know, these are these are these are those wonderful sermons that search the heart of a matter. The, the, this, this is like dealing with the heart series. It's the it's the stuff that nobody wants to talk about, nobody wants to like. These are the things that clear churches out and make people upset and they walk away. And I say, if you're going to leave, if you're going to leave because the word of God is preached to you and, and, and your pride gets hurt, hope your head can fit through the door. Because if you think I'm going to back off and stop preaching God's word and I'm not going to thunder out the truth when, when people want to walk and live in pride and wickedness, you got the wrong preacher. 
You're looking for the 12 other ones down the street in this town that will appease your conscience. Because we're either going to be real or we're not. That's just all there is to it. We're either going to follow this book, but we sure aren't going to fake it. Because I'm going to tell you what, if I'm going to be wicked, then I'm going to go be wicked. But if I'm going to be real, then I'm going to be real. I'm not going to live my life a fake and a phony and walk around and acting like I'm something when I'm really not. I can't. I hate that. I hate it. I hate it when people put on a false humility, put on a fake facade, and act like they're something and they're not, and you're nothing but a liar. And I hate it. And God hates it. That's right. Another consequence of immoderate self-esteem is an insatiable desire of propagating in others the favorable opinion he entertains of himself. He therefore tortures his invention for means to make himself conspicuous and to draw the eyes of the world upon him. But for the most part, it is ordered by providence that the schemes of the ambitious are disappointed so that still when pride cometh, then cometh shame but with the lowly is wisdom. There are sometimes people do a bunch of things to be noticed by people. And then a lot of times they don't get noticed. And then they get mad, which proves that that's the reason they were doing it. It proves that that's the reason they were doing it is because they wanted somebody to notice them. That's not why we do things. We do them because it's right. We do them because we love. And something done without love, without the motivation of love, is a waste of time. It's not real charity. It's not sincere. It's not true. And the fruit of it will manifest as pride. And you lose the reward. When pride cometh, that is, when a person becomes self-conceited and arrogant, then cometh shame, for such a person is beyond teaching and is bound finally to make a fool of themselves. I've seen it. <clears throat> you want to grab, please grab me some water, Dad, back there. <clears throat> I'm going to need some. Um, when, when you get to that point, when somebody gets to that point, they're beyond te- I I've seen it, folks. I've seen it I, where you plead with people, you pour your heart out to them, you do whatever you can to get them to wake up. And at the end of the day, they won't do it. You try to help them, thank you, you you try to help them and do whatever you can for them and you pour your life out to help them. But you cannot make them do right. You cannot make them live for God. You cannot make them obey. No matter how hard you try, no matter how much you pray, no matter how much you do, if they don't want to do right, they're not going to do it. Number three, the evil fruit of pride is contention. Proverbs chapter 13, verse number 10, please. Proverbs chapter 13, verse number 10. Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. And here's the the real key I want you to think about. The obstinacy which attends self-conceit produces contention. Obstinacy which attends self-conceit. It's conceited. It's upon myself. I think of myself more highly than I ought to. I think something. I'm, I'm really a great person. Right? It's the opposite of sober. It's not a sober estimate of oneself, but it's self-conceit. I have to make myself feel better, so I'm, I'm, a, good, I'm a really good person. It's like Donald Trump. 
They need to get to know me. I'm a great person. <laughs> He's a winner. We're going to win again. I can't start cuz if I don't if I keep going I just I won't I won't be able to stop. It's just like really bad. Oh, it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be tremendous. I'm telling you. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> okay. <laughs> Shoot the rabbit back on the back on the on the trail. All right. The obstinacy which attends self-conceit produces contention, which the well-advised thus inventing modesty avoid. That's what happens. Pride, the fruit of it, produces contention. Got to have an argument. Got to have a war. Got to be at war and at an argument with somebody. Instead of being at it with the devil, it's got to be somebody else. Right. War is always started through the pride of life. Look at the wars in our, in our, in our world. Why are they always started? The pride of life. Right? It's all pride. One man said it this way, Would you know whence come wars and fightings? They come from this root of bitterness. Whatever hand other lusts may have in contention, passion, envy, covetousness, pride has the great hand. It is its pride that it will itself sow discord and needs no help. Pride makes men impatient of contradiction in either their opinions or their desires. Makes them impatient. If somebody contradicts them at all, and they're impatient when they can't deal with it. They can't be wrong. Impatient of competition. If there's any competition out there, anybody competing, anybody that has similar talents and gifts from God or anything like that, it becomes a competition and they're impatient with it. Impatient of rivalship, impatient of contempt, or anything that looks like a slight, and impatient of concession and receding from a, from a conceit of certain right and truth on their side. So in other words, basically, basically they get impatient. If, if it looks like they've been slighted in some way, they got to go after it. Not giving somebody the benefit of the doubt but just already assuming and evil surmising that that person's against me. Impatient of concession. Saul, that's right. That's exactly how Saul was. And hence arise quarrels among relations and neighbors, quarrels in states and kingdoms, in churches and Christian societies. Men will be revenged, will not forgive, because they are proud. Those that are humble and peaceable, are wise and well advised. Those that will ask and take advice, that will consult their own consciences, their Bibles, their pastors, their friends, and will do nothing rashly, are wise as in other things. So in this, that they will humble themselves, will stoop and yield to preserve quietness and prevent quarrels. It is chiefly pride which blows up the coals of contention. Stokes them up. Self-conceited. Pride. Thinking of myself more highly than I ought to. Well-advised. Who are not governed by their passions, but by prudent considerations will forsake that. Wisdom which teaches them to avoid contention. You know, one of the number one things that I, that I see, and by the way, you don't avoid contention by having hard feelings and walking away and not talking about something. That's not avoiding contention. That's harboring it up in your heart. That's a root of bitterness that you're going to unleash on somebody someday. That eats your guts up and causes you to die. Gives you a heart attack. The root of bitterness that destroys you. That's not putting something away. That's not forgiveness. It's not what that is. That's pride. You know, you know one of the things that, uh, and listen to that a active self-protection guy, one of the things that he talks about uh, is de-escalating a situation. 
is being able to, you know what, it doesn't matter if you have a firearm on you, it doesn't matter if, you can, if you're a great defender, you should always, if you can, try to de-escalate a situation. And you do that, he, he, t he said you do that through verbal judo. You know, you try, you, 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 you're fighting with your words and you're trying to de-escalate it. You're not, that's, so you're not going like this, you know, what'd you say, punk? Huh? <laughs> did you just look at me funny? Huh? What did, you, did you just look at me funny? What's the matter with you? That's not de-escalated. You don't want me to come over there and knock that nose off your face, do you? That's not de-escalating it. That's what punks do. All right? What men do is they try to de-escalate it. Sir, I don't know what your problem is. I, what's wrong? I, what, did somebody do something to offend you? What, what did I do? You know, trying to talk them down. Because you don't want a confrontation. And especially as a Christian, you're not supposed to want that. You're to try to de-escalate that. right pride if there be no cause of contention given will make it pride will make a fight with somebody they'll invent it just looking for a standoff looking for a fight Transcendo obedio perturbo is the motto written. This is that's is the motto written upon pride's triple crown. Says John Trapp, a proud person is full of discontent, no peace in the soul. A proud person is full of discontent. They you won't be happy around them because they can't be happy. Because they are discontented and nothing makes them happy. Nothing is good enough for them. They can always find a fault with that person. Always find a fault with somebody. Because they're looking for it. Because they have a heart of discontent. And sometimes you just look at somebody and say, you know what, the problem ain't me, Jack. The problem's you. You can't be happy. And there ain't nobody can make you happy. Jesus has to make you happy. And that's through submission to the Holy Ghost, because you ain't going to be happy any other way. Your husband, your wife, your friend, your nobody's going to be good enough for you, and nobody's going to make you happy. You are a discontented soul because you are proud. That's right. A proud person is full of discontent. Nothing can please him. Just like one that hath a swelling in his hands, something or other toucheth it still and driveth him to outcries. Pride maketh a man drunk with his own conceit. Drunk on himself. On his own self-worth. Self-centered, that's right. The proud man is as he that hath transgressed by wine. And drunkards we know are quarrelsome. Oh yeah, you get somebody drunk, man, they want to fight. That's right. The proud man is he that hath transgressed by wine, and drunkards we know are quarrelsome. The Corinthians had riches and gifts and learning and carried aloft of, by these waxen wings. They domineered and despised others. They were divided and discontented. And these overflowings of the gall and spleen came from the fullness of bad humor. Pride is a dividing distemper. Gouty, swollen legs keep at a distance. Bladders blown up with the wind spurt one from another and will not close. <laughs> John Traff had a way with words. But prick them and you may pack a thousand of them in a little room. <laughs> what was he saying, though? What he's saying, though, is the Corinthian church, hey, they had all the gifts in the world, but they're a bunch of conceited fools. They had all the gifts. They boasted about their gifts. And they had to show them to everybody. And everybody had to know what gift they had. Right. They exalted themselves. The evil fruit of pride next is deceit. Ah, this is the worst fruit, I believe, of it all. I believe this... This particular cluster, this grape on the cluster of pride here is, is probably the, the, most, the most damaging one. 
of them all. I believe this to be the worst of it all, besides the end thereof that leads to death. But this is the worst. Obadiah chapter 1, verse number 3. Garrett's not going for Obadiah. He has not fallen for it. He has not fallen for going for Obadiah. He can't find it. He doesn't know where it is. He's not even attempting it. He's like, he's like, I'm not, you're watching me. I'm flipping pages. Yeah, I did, yeah. <laughs> Obadiah 1 3. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Pride. Pride brings deceit. It bring, The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. I'm telling you, this is, the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Above all things, it is what? It is deceitful. Deceitful. Deceit in the heart. It's damaging. It's deadly. It's poison. Satan wanted to, he was, he was caught up in his own pride, wasn't he? He kept saying, I will exalt myself above the stars of God. I will sit on the congregation of the sides of the north. I will be like the Most High. What did God say that, it, that, it, that he was eaten up with it, wasn't he? Find me that verse. Find, find me, Brother Nate, find that uh, the text. Is it Isaiah chapter 14? Isaiah 14. That's what I thought it was, was 14, but I wasn't sure. Isaiah chapter 14. Thank you. For thou hast said in thine heart, well, actually, uh, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation of the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Pride brings deceit, and Satan deceived himself into believing that he could actually take the throne of God. And I will submit to you that that same pride is what dwells in a man that believes that he will do the same to God, that he will exalt himself above God. He will ex Every time you are too proud to listen to instruction, what you are saying is, I will exalt myself above God's word. I will be like the Most High. How do we do that? Well, when I can't find the solutions to my problems in the Word of God, I am saying that I will exalt myself above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High because God's book doesn't have an answer for me. It doesn't have the victory in it for me. So I will exalt myself above God, and I will be. You're saying I will be like the devil. That's what you're saying. And you know what? It shows. You're just like him. Is that a little too tough? Well, I'm not done yet. The Edomites were justifiably proud of their fortress stronghold in the rocky vastness of Mount Zaire, the rugged country south of Palestine and extending to the Gulf of, whatever that word is, I can't even read it. Their principal, their principal city was Petra, one of the most spectacular fortresses of the entire ancient world. Their great error was that of trusting in themselves instead of trusting in God. They were proud. No one could get through to them. That's the deceit of pride. That's what pride does to you. You're right. Nobody can get to you. Deceive thee, magnifying thy strength above what really it is. I see a lot of young men that do that when they're ready to charge hell with a squirt gun, and they're, they're, they're ready to go, and they're ready to do everything they want to do, and, man, they're just ready to go. They are They are ready. No, they are ready to get in trouble. That's what they're ready for. 
The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, so as to make thee think thyself some great business when it's no such matter, that thou canst secure thyself in thy strongholds from thy strongest enemies. But here in thy pride hath befooled thee, and put the same trick upon thee that the serpent did once put upon the first woman. Who complained when she was in the transgression? The serpent hath deceived me. He is still the king of all the children of pride. You walk in pride, you're being led by the devil. Because he's the king of it. That's right. And thereby cheateth them and ravisheth them of their right reason and rendereth them the direct objects of God's hatred and heavy displeasure. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Do you understand what you do? When you get pride and you get proud and you don't listen to instructions, do you realize what you've done? You are setting God against you. It says God resisteth the proud. What does that mean? What does it mean to resist? Well, the Bible says to resist the devil and he will flee from you. So what does that resistance mean? I'm fighting him. I'm warring against him. So guess what? When you walk in pride, you are warring against God. Or actually, God is warring against you. Because it says, God resisteth the proud. Giveth grace to the humble. Though his excellency mount up to the heavens concerning the proud person and his head reach into the clouds, yet he shall perish forever like his own dung. They that have seen him shall say, where is he? You know, there's a deceitfulness in sin. Deceives us. It's like thinking we could take hold of that snake and we'll be all right. It's like people that take hold of the liquor bottle and think, ah, I can do it casually. I can control myself. Stingeth like an adder. Whoso, who, whoever, whosoever is deceived is not wise. Right? There is a deceitfulness in sin, a lie in all these outward vanities. They were never true to those that trusted in them. But the proud person feedeth upon ashes. He feedeth himself with false hopes because he's deceived. A deceived heart hath turned him aside, put him into a fool's paradise that he cannot deliver his soul. Get out of his golden dreams. Nor says, is there not a lie in my right hand? His case is not unlike that man's who's lying fast asleep upon the edge of a steep rock, dreams merrily of much happiness and safety, but upon the sudden startling for joy breaks his neck and tumbles headlong into the bottom of the sea. Pride is nothing to play with. It's something to repent of. It's something to be very conscientious of. And always be looking at my motives, always be looking at, at what I'm doing, always be studying my own heart to make sure by the grace of God and through the word of God that, I've not give, that, I, that I have not hardened my heart and stiffened my neck to God's word. Pride is a venomous poison that seeps into the lives of even the mightiest of men. It claims self-sufficiency and independence as a focal point for one's accomplishments. Who wants to be dependent on anyone or anything? Yet God is desiring a humble spirit to realize that we can't live this life in our own strength. Even when we don't give praise and honor to God, he is still where the strength is coming from. We are just not admitting it to ourselves. The prophet Ob Obadiah identifies arrogance as one of those roots of self-deception. The pride of your heart has deceived you. Human pride always blinds us to truth. I never see, You know what? I'll tell you this. I've seen a pattern of this. People that people that are proud that will not accept the truth when it is evidently set forth before them, they are blinded in every other area. And you can see it. They are just completely blind. They cannot see afar off. 
because they're pride. They are stuck in pride. The Bible says, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self, own selves. Pride deceives a man into believing he is right when he is clearly wrong. It is pride that allows him to continue his sinful course and blame others for his faults. Self-deception is illustrated tragically by Samson. This mighty hero of Israel disclosed the secret of his strength to Delilah, who betrayed him to his enemies as he slept. Once his hair had been cut, Samson, Samson, the Philistines be upon thee. Samson said, I'll go out and before like I did, and I'll just shake myself like I did before, and I'll go take care of him. But he wist not that the Lord had departed from him. Because his own pride, he couldn't see it. Couldn't see that he had lost the power of God. Because he was walking in his own pride. Samson learned the hard way that forgetting the word of God is a form of self-deception. How about the church of Laodicea? It was, the, it's the, it was the victim of self-deception concerning their spiritual condition, right? Turn to Revelation chapter 3, please, verse number 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyes sad that thou mayest see. Look at this. Look at this, what he says later. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. It won't seem like love to those that are, those that are proud, though. It never does. I've, it's ne I've never ceased to amaze me that I've seen people that, that I've had to rebuke and I've had to reprove as a pastor. And I, I'll tell you what, the last thing they think of it is love. Why is that? Well, just like he told them. He looked at that church and he said, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. You think that this was like this sweet little message he was delivering to them? Does this sound very sweet and 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 uh, it, it, did it sound very soft and and you know and like whispering it to them? No, I don't think so. What did he tell them? He looked at this this church that was an established church. And he looked at them and he said, "I he said I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth." Sounds pretty direct, doesn't it? I mean, he told them, I will spew thee out of my mouth. I'm going to get rid of you if you don't stop. I'm going to take your candlestick away. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and black. What were they full of self-conceit? They were deceived. They were deceived in thinking that their bodies, their bucks, and their programs, and everything else that they had, all the things that they had going on for them, that they were right. All the gifts and the talents and everything they could do and all this other, that they were right. And God said, you don't have any power. You have no passion. You have no zeal. What did he say to them? You need some heat. You are lukewarm. You need some heat. You're walking around like a bunch of zombies, just doing things through the motions, but you have no passion and fire for God. It's because of your pride. You think you have it all together. You think everything is right. You think everything is good, and you are deceived by your own pride. He said you're blind. Human pride is incredibly deceitful. It can so deceive its host that he or she may well believe they are truly humble. 
It is true of all proud people, for pride is self-deceit. Some reading this may be proud. In fact, it is those who believe they have no pride who are most likely the proudest of all. Those who are proud of their humility are proud indeed. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Pride lays a person open to be deceived. His judgment is perverted by it. Pride leads its victim, victims into evil ways. They become defiant. They become destitute of compassion because pride is stony-hearted. Can't get through to them. They're like a, they're like a stone. They become destitute of compassion. They become defiant. You give them the truth, and they become defiant, and they do the absolute opposite. Why? Pride. Like Nabal, that's right. I can't admit that I, I can't admit that I'm wrong because you know. I can't let that person be right about correcting me, so I'm just not going to give in. Which is very immature, by the way, because you never grow spiritually. You never grow spiritually like that. Never. And you won't. Like a pack of wolves, these, these people gang up on those they oppress. They show contempt for what is holy. In the, tw in the early 21st century, those who are seeking to replace the church with something new do to do away with guilt, repentance, the sovereignty of God, fallen man, to name just a few things, are the self-deceived. They actually believe they are right because they are deceived. It renders men in great measures blind to their own faults. The man of a proud heart will not see his own faults. He has no desire to see them. He would sooner see anything else in the world than see the bad side of his own character. And, of course, he takes every precaution to avoid the honest view of himself. He has no intention or even desire to find his own proper level in society, but tries to deceive both himself and others. He would fain imagine that he is a vastly better person than he really is and make everybody else believe it if he can. Hence, he will overlook his own faults, whether holy, that means holy in that way, or at least as far as he can, and would be glad to make others do the same. This is one of the workings of a proud heart. It leads men to imagine that they have virtues which they have not. This is often manifest in their egotistical manner of speaking. In their common conversation, they assume that they possess virtues which nobody ever saw them exhibit or ever dreamed of attributing to them. Whatever in their own conduct has the remotest appearance of virtue, they are sure to drag it into their service to prove themselves the best of men. It leads men to overrate the apparent virtues which they really possess. I say apparent virtues, for while a man is a proud of heart, he can have no real virtue. Semblances of virtue he may have, and these his heart, his and these his pride of heart will lead him to exaggerate as much as possible. He will be sure to give himself more credit for even these than he deserves. It leads to an uncandid estimation of ourselves. The proud man becomes, of course, partial in his views of his own merits, committed to self and incapable of taking sober views of his own real character. Pride of heart is always prone to make self-flattering comparisons. The proud man is never slow to institute comparisons between himself and others, but will be always sure to give himself the advantage. He is always better than his neighbors. Although he may be an impenitent sinner, he is better than the most professed Christians. The pride of his heart hath deceived him. The proud man avoids making humiliating comparisons between himself and others. If there are those with whom he cannot compare himself favorably, he turns away from them and avoids them if he can. The painful self-mortification of contemplating superior excellence or perhaps more often he will set himself to traduce their character and will create or at least retail the ag and aggravate slander against them until he can flatter himself that they are below him. 
So he builds up slatter, slander against other people to, to lift himself up until he finally sees himself in his own eyes as, I'm better than that dude. I'm better than that Christian. I'm better than that brother. And this is why. And they've built it up in their mind so much that they're better than that other person. That's the deceit of pride. Then and then only can he feel happy to let them alone. Then after I do that, I want nothing to do with that person. Now that I'm better than them, I don't need them. I don't need to have anything to do with them. The sight of superior excellence is annoying, not to say agonizing. So he goes about to level it down and make himself and others believe that the reputed best man is not as good as himself. Oh, I know more about it than that, than that person does. Do you realize you can't really pastor a church like that if you really, if you really care about people? Because there are some things that I don't know about, and that's why I tell you to talk to some other people. That's why concerning like maintenance and things that goes on in this building, I want Lee to handle. Why? Because he has experience with it, and he's been here ever since the second service. And I trust his judgment. I don't have to be the person that knows, oh, I, I know more than you do about that. Because I would be lying. <laughs> I would just, I would be lying. And to think of myself more highly than I ought to. Right? It would be like I'd sit down with Brother Finney and be like, no, look, Brother Finney. When he, when he called me up about some legal matters and we were looking at possibly having to go to court or whatever or anything like that, you know, if we ever had to go to court or anything like that, or when he's in Texas, let's say, and he's dealing with it, when he was dealing with uh, people, his, his uh, let's use that as an example. When you're dealing with people in Texas, when you're dealing with one of your, if, if your client sits down with you and they try to tell you how to do things. Be like, Brother Finney, be like me saying, oh, Brother Finney, look, this church state law thing, I need you to understand something, okay, brother? Now, let me show you about 501c3. Did I do that when, when you called me on the phone or I talked to you on the phone? I sat there and I just learned from him. I called him all the time. I, call, I don't know how many times I called you, but it was a lot. And we were on the phone a lot. And I read his materials and I studied it and I asked him questions. And still today, if somebody asks me a specific question about that, I still point them to him. Why? Because he knows what he's talking about. That's why. And I don't have to be the person that answers every question. And I don't think I know more than him about that. And I don't have to make him look small for me to look big. That's pride. And it's not love either. It's the complete opposite of love. It is pride of heart that begets envy, that fills society with slander and makes it so grateful to the feelings of some men to pick at the character of their more excellent neighbors. They have to look at somebody and pick something apart with them. Listen, if you, if you, if you, start, if you, if you start looking at the faults of your brothers and you start picking things out about them and you, you feel like this, this strong urge and desire to pick them apart, that's pride. That's pride. That's just pride. And it's wicked. And, it, and you're deceived. Because you believe it's okay. You believe there's some kind of virtue in you doing that. And that's wicked. It is an abomination. 
This is the reason why so many of the best men are slandered and why so few escape its shafts. You cannot make them see their own faults. They're deceived. They will dodge and shuffle. They will dodge and shuffle, change the subject if they can, and look in every other direction, re direction rather than within. One man says, in courts of justice, you may sometimes see a man pushed to admit a fact that incriminates himself, and you may mark his shuffling and evasion. Is that true, Brother Finney? You can see it on their face that they're shuffling, they're trying to evade. Yeah. And his skill in denying or concealing the fact that he is badly crowded. But the same thing occurs often enough out of court when the pride of a man's heart makes him hate the light and stubbornly, though often awkwardly, shut his eyes against it. You may hold up the light close to his face. He can't see. Try to open his eyes. He doesn't see anything. You may draw his character to the life. He does not recognize the likeness because he does not wish to. What is the reason? Pride of heart. It often seems as if a proud man would sooner go to hell than open his eyes to see candidly his own faults. I've seen it. I've sat and talked to people before. I've seen it. And they, they, you, they will not admit they're wrong. They've got to point out somebody else's wrong. They will not just admit that, yep, that's me. And fix it. It's a sad place for somebody that names the name of Christ to be. It ought not be, friend. Some seem determined never to know themselves. They will evade self-knowledge, press it upon their attention as you may. You may try to seize them to hold the mirror before their eyes. They will shut their eyes or turn their heads round. You cannot make them look into any moral self-revealer. I've known cases in which a man's friend have tried to seize him and hold him still long enough to get the truth before his eyes, but they might as well have tried to grasp the north wind because they won't see it. You put it right in front of their face, and they don't, they're not going to look at it. Why? Because they don't want it to be right. They don't want to know. They don't want any self-revealers. They're too busy revealing the, the faults of everybody else. Their deceit will not allow them to deal inwardly. It's pride. Self-righteousness is deceit and causes, causes us not to try to search out. We don't want to say, search me, O God, and know my thoughts. Try me and know my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. I don't want to do that. Not at all. Self-deception is dangerous. Self-deception is disastrous. When you have been deceived by another, that person shares the blame for your condition. But when your deception is self-imposed, you alone are accountable. Further, self-deception is perniciously destructive. It is hard to detect and harder to eliminate. Think about it. Have you ever met a person who admitted to being self-deceived? The very nature of self-deception is that there is no conscious awareness of believing lies. Self-deception emerges from living on a self-referential basis. Such people measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves to themselves. And Paul says they're not wise. The evil fruit of pride is self-deceit. It is just deceitful. And you just you, you pride develops deceit in the heart, and it's dangerous. Next, the evil fruit of pride is to be brought low. And when I mean low, I don't mean of a broken and contrite spirit. I mean dashed into pieces. Proverbs twenty nine twenty three: A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. A man's pride shall bring him low. A proud man is universally despised, and such are often exposed to great mortifications. Pride is also the source of continual mortification. The petty vexations of pride that are compounded with every vain, selfish, and malignant passion have no claim to our indulgence. Pride is more productive of quarrels, bitterness, and strife than anything else. This base and selfish passion always creates and always keeps alive a watchful and incessant jealousy of power. 
It's a control scheme. A proud person wants to control everything. They'll use flattery. They'll use manipulation. They'll use whatever they can. They want to control things. That's Donald Trump. Very proud man. Very controlling man. And as you'll listen to on the Sound the Battle Cry that will be released in a few days here, you'll hear that he's controlling masses of people through deception. Pride is more productive of quarrels. Hence, the mildest exhortation and the most friendly remonstrance is often converted into the bitterness of accusations or the insolence of reproach. So pride makes you take a little thing that happened and you turn it into this great big blow up. It's like, wait a minute, why did that get so big? It was, it's not even that big of a deal. Well, everything is when you're self-absorbed, everything is a big deal. Everything that happens to you is a big deal. Now, everything you do to others, eh, not so much. But everything that, everything that happens to you, big, huge, big deal. Tremendous, big deal. That's right. Yeah, straight in a gnat. That's right. That's right. That's what it is. The littlest thing, man, I got to find a way to be offended by this. How can I be offended by this? Yeah, exactly. Look for a way to be offended and look for a way to blow it up into something. Listen very closely, please. This odious vice of pride and is seen at its worst in the awful end of the suicide. The dreadful act of self-destruction is often committed in the evil moment of wounded pride or mortified ambition. Most of the people that I've seen that are suicidal, it's because their pride is hurt in some way. And they can't live with themselves. They can't take that their pride is going to be hurt. They've lived a lie, they've, or they've been hurt, or somebody is hurt, and really it's their pride that has been hurt so drastically that they cannot... Live another day underneath those unbearable circumstances of self being being put down or being being uh, challenged. I mean, how many times? I I mean, I could show you through the Bible. If you want to see every single example of suicide, you will see that. How about David's counselor when Absalom did not listen to Ahithophel? What did Ahithophel do? got on his happy horse, rode home, and hung himself. Why? Because he was the wisest man in the kingdom. And nobody listened to him, and his pride was so wounded that he hung himself. Right? The proud man sits on an imaginary eminence of his own creation and propagates servility or wretchedness all around him. In a mind thus bewildered and deceived, the first principle of improvement is wanting. He who is not conscious of any defect can have no sufficient motive for amendment. Pride never appears so sinful and offensive as when we consider man in the relation to his maker. Then we perceive it, destroying the efficacy and poisoning the very source of all those virtues which he is chiefly bound to practice. The proud man is in reality always degraded in proportion as he thinks himself exalted. They're brought down. A man's pride shall bring him low, for it sets God against him. And angels and men, not good men only, but bad men too, and those that are as proud as themselves. Listen very closely, and I've seen this happen. I've seen this happen to people that are gone. For whereas one drunkard loves another and one thief another, one proud person cannot endure another, but seeks to undermine him that he alone may bear the bell, carry the condemnation and praise and promotion. I watched two guys ate up with pride, destroy each other and leave within a month apart of each other. Right. Why? Pride. It was all pride. And they're so proud they go preach together. How about that? 
That ain't crazy. If that ain't cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, I don't know what is, man. Right? Yeah, it is. <laughs> That's exactly what that is. <laughs> don't make us do more memes, okay? We're just not going to go there. The fruit of pride is destruction. Proverbs sixteen eighteen. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride is thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. It is corruption of self-love. You know what it is? It's self-flattery. Yep. A man thinks too highly of himself when he thinks that anything he has is his own or, that, or when he conceives himself to have what he really has not or when he challenges more respect than is due to him on, on the score of what he has. Pride is not peculiar to persons of any one rank. Pride is lofty thoughts of ourselves, and it brings us down disdain of others. Boastful talk, rash and vain actions, the evils of pride, it separates us from God, makes men hate us, and brings us to ruin. What did Nabal do to David? He made David rise up, and David was ready to go destroy everything that pisseth against the wall. Destroy. Why? Because that, he hated that pride and that Nabal so much. He could not stand it, and he hated it so much. He was like, I, 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 I got to destroy everything around him. Everything that pisseth against the wall, all the men are dead. I'm going to kill all of them. I protected his men. He laughed at me, mocked me. I'm going to destroy him. That's what, that's what that spirit does to people. Right? That's what that spirit does to people. Pride will have a fall. Those that are of a haughty spirit that think of themselves above what is meet and look with contempt upon others, that with their pride affront God and disquiet others, will be brought down, either by repentance or by ruin. It is the honor of God to humble the proud. It is the act of justice that those who have lifted up themselves should be laid low. Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, where instances, instances of this, men cannot punish pride, but either admire it or fear it, and therefore God will take the punishing of it in his own hands. Let him alone to deal with proud men. What did he do? What did Nabal, Abigail came and told him, hey, listen, David, I know you're ready to kill them all, and I understand but let God deal with him. God will take care of hitting the ball. Just let God deal with his pride. God will deal with him. And what happened? He listened. Right? And he watched. He just stepped back and watched. Heart turned to stone. Died. Dead. Proud men are frequently most proud and insolent and haughty just before their destruction. That's a scary thing, by the way. If you're, if, 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 if you're boasting in your own pride and you're lifting yourself up in your own pride, you're, you're about ready to be destroyed. Because it's the one thing that God hates, a proud look. It's an abomination to him and he hates it. When proud men set God's judgments at defiance and think themselves at the greatest distance from them, it is a sign that they are at the door. Witness the case of Benadad and Herod. While the word was in the king's mouth, Nebuchadnezzar, while the word was in his mouth, what happened to him? He was turned to a beast. God is able to abase them that are proud, Nebuchadnezzar said. Therefore, let us not fear the pride of others, but greatly fear pride in ourselves. Uh, John Trapp said this, A bulging wall is near a downfall. Swelling is a dangerous symptom in the body. So is pride in the soul. Surely as the swelling of the spleen is dangerous for health and of the sails for the overbearing of a little vessel, so is the swelling of the heart by pride. 
Pride goes before destruction. For self-exaltation blinds a person against dangers and against the growing resentment of other people and thus hastens his fall and a haughty spirit before a fall, the herald of the proud person's overthrow. Pride goeth before destruction. It is commonly a forerunner and, co and cause of men's ruin because it highly provokes both God and men. It's a very dangerous thing. That's the fruit of pride. It ends in death. It ends in destruction. That pride, I've seen people's pride destroy everything around them. Sometimes they repent and God rebuilds them a better way. Amen. Sometimes they don't and he crushes them. And destroys them for their sin because God hates pride. And the scariest part of all is when people say they don't see it. And it's so evident. So very evident. It's dangerous. Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that we can be warned from the Word of God, warned against the pride that lurks up in our hearts. And Lord, that we pray every day, Lord, or should pray every day, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. And we understand that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Help us, Lord. Help us never to give in to the flesh with pride. Help us, Lord, when the plain truth is showed to us that we submit and humble ourselves. And not harden our hearts and stiffen our neck. But we humble ourselves to it. And we get it right. Dear God, it's a dangerous thing for us to be hard-hearted and proud. The deceit of pride is so strong and powerful that we won't realize it until we've already walked off the cliff to our own doom. Help us, Lord, to be sensitive to it. Help us to have a right and sober estimation of ourselves and not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. Prepare our hearts, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.